Well, time flies. Here we are at the end of our six weeks. I am, as you know, Bob Bell, and I'm coming to you out of the ecclesiastical bullpen because I'm the closer, so to speak, for this <laughs> series. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is not a council of despair, but it's a hymn of praise not only to God, but all of creation. And in a way, as AJ says, it's sort of a theological pep talk. And good pep talks or revivals don't just kind of make us feel better about ourselves, but they inspire us to do better, try harder, dig more deeply, find resources for the uh, living of these days, as Harry Emerson Fosdick put it in a hymn, God of grace and God of glory. So we want to let the light shine on others, as scripture says. Although the Sermon on the Mount uh, begins with the Beatitudes and promises of comfort, it moves unyieldingly to challenges to that comfort. And I hope we have found that Jesus is not kind of selling us uh, and his disciples uh, false hope in this past, in these parts, he's excruciatingly honest with the disciples and with us. Uh, as A.J. noted, uh, no one said that the path would be easy. So this noontide, we will explore various aspects of the challenging narrow road into the kingdom of heaven. But let's put a prayer on it. It's always good to put a prayer on things. So I'll pray us up to start. God of grace and glory, on your people, pour your power as you did at Pentecost. We have been called to journey through this broken, imperfect world, and how we need that in these November days in this USA, to hear that call. You call us with our own imperfect lives into the new. We give thanks for Amy Jill and Jenny and Patty who have led us the past weeks. And once more we pray, guide us on the road that leads to life, following in the footsteps of our great teacher, our Lord Jesus. Here we go again, Lord, go thou with us, amen. Uh, if you tuned in uh, late, I made note that if you tried to download the handout piece from today's website, it was a, a sheet for the kids. Somehow the kids thing got in there, but you'll you'll manage without the handout. Not well, but you'll manage. Um, and I'm going to switch to a screen share here. Okay, um, just an overview of what we're doing today to read the Sermon on the Mount as a teaching given by one Jew to fellow Jews, as you can see there. If we get Jesus' context wrong, we're going to get it wrong. But if we get it right, and my task is to shepherd us through this uh, final segment here and we want to identify some of the challenges of that narrow road and talking about ways along the journey in which the church community can support etc as you see there are one two three four five six seven readings and I'd like um, some of the participants to pick one that they're willing to read. And you'll have to say your name because I can't see you all on the screen. Matthew 7, 6, who wants to read that? It'll, I'll put it up on the screen. I'll read it. This is Jenny. Jenny, okay. 7, 7 to 11. 
This is Karen. I'll read it. Karen. Verse 12. This is Judy. I'll read it. Judy. If you're shouting out and not unmuted, you'll have to do that. Uh, 7, 13, 14. And. And. 15 to 20. I'll do it. It's Nick. Nick. 21 to 24. Gene, I can do that. Who is it? Gene. Oh, I recognize you know, that voice. You no, know Gene. <laughs> <laughs> and 25 to 28. Somebody can do two if they want. I'll do two. And it's. 24 to 28 or is that Jenny? Yeah, Jenny. So 24 okay. to 29. All right. Uh, this seven eight here is, is kind of a strange little verse. And uh, let me get it back here and we'll Okay, uh, Jenny. Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Strange little verse here. AJ notes that dogs does not refer to Gentiles. There are some people who have suggested that that's what it refers to, but she gives a pretty clear explanation of that not being so. Uh, N.T. Wright. How many remember that name? N.T. Wright. We were in a class earlier in the year with him. I said, it seems to be a warning for his followers not to try and explain the meaning and life of the kingdom to people who won't understand the Jewish world within which it makes sense. And I think that's where A.J. comes in really well because she can help us understand of, as a Jew to a Jew. So we have the um, the, the uh, reference to pearl here. Do any of you know any other passage in the Bible with the reference to pearl? Unmute if you're going to speak. Jean? It was the pearl of great price that a man found and hid uh, buried in the field and then went and bought the field. Very good. You get extra credit for that. Uh, I'll <laughs> give you a prize later. Um, Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Yes, it's a parable of Jesus. Uh, something really, really precious and, and it's not to be wasted. So for us, the community of Westminster um, Church, uh, how can our community of faith help you use your press, precious resources wisely? How can our community help use precious things like pearls? Not literally pearls. The first thing that comes to my mind is just the way we are organized with leadership. Oh, shoot. I'm sorry about that. Now my phone's going to ring. Gonna... Okay. Anybody else want to chime, chime in? Well, to pick up on that, yes, the leadership. Um, I feel that there's a way that we communicate where there's great talent and acceptance for a new vision and new actions. So when my energy or my resources are given, um, it, chances are they'll be fruitful. And because of knowing the community, um, having the same like mind, that's one way. Um, personally, it's been a little harder to remember not to waste pearls and cast them where they are no, of no value, but when they are valued and can contribute to do that. 
The other piece that I was thinking and hope my phone doesn't ring is having been involved on the nominate. Do you believe that on having been involved uh -huh. in the nominating committee? Um, we seek to look at members knowing that there's pearls out there, maybe that they don't even realize. And I think that that idea of knowing that there, there are great gifts among people out there is a way to not waste pearls. Sorry about this phone. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good way of, of <laughs> tracking uh, the gifts that are out there. Okay, let's move on here to the next verse. And Karen. Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who if your child asks for bread will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good good gifts? Sorry. Will, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Thanks, Karen. Uh, note that the one uh, is not knocking on the door of a stranger, but it, it's somebody from the community, somebody they know. And you pick this up, uh, as AJ says in the context, because it goes on later talking about parents and children. So it's not a, you're not going to some strange door and knocking. It's not a, a trick or treat just going up and down the block and even people you don't know. And the, the question for us to rummage around a little bit with, how have you experienced your community of faith's willingness to answer the needs of those who knock? How has you experienced your community of faith's willingness to answer the needs of those who knock? I think um, when the community reaches out, uh, the church responds in a positive way uh -huh. with through the senior center meals Okay, um, through the giving tree for the different organizations in the uh, community that are in need. Um, whenever there's a need in the community or worldwide, uh, I think our hands reach out to them one way or another. Any others? Yeah, on a... Um... It's amazing to me that I found or God guided me to Westminster and there's a you know, global connection, a uh, national connection and community. And also the Stephen ministry of the very one-to-one -one and walk with each other when a person reaches out for that ministry. Mm -hmm. And in I think Deacon, this morning, go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say, in Deacons, when we bring extended communion to nursing homes and to hospitals and stuff, um, I always feel okay. like they're really knocking for you know to get to the Lord, and by bringing communion to them, we're opening that door for them. So indeed, you are feeding them with the bread and the cup as you right. go hither and yon. Those at worship this morning, was there a knock at the door from Honduras? Yes. Um, hurricanes. As they were noting that, that we can help support the needs of the, the, hur the double hurricanes, uh, Gene and I looked at each other and said, we need to answer that door, so to speak. I think we will. Well, it was interesting. Don and I, while well, Anne was in the sanctuary doing her part, we're, we're limiting pastors being at the same time so she was in there speaking had her mask off so don and i were sitting in the narthex 
with our masks on and somebody knocked at the door to the entry to come into the building and they were um it was terry pennington and i think it was carol edwards and i saw scott um seymour but they were bringing gifts for the christmas you know gifts that are going to be delivered um to the so i thought well there literally was a knock at the door um this morning but how generous this congregation is in sharing gifts mm -hmm. at christmas you know with as ann was saying we still have 67 gift requests um you know people want to contribute but that was just a, a very literal knock at the door have to be careful that we don't get prideful that oh you know look at all the doors that we're answering but mm -hmm. indeed uh the congreg i think the congregation does well answering those knocks um that little part about if your child asks for bread do you give them a stone not all parents are responsible as we know and aj also applies jesus words to his disciples relationship to god if, if we ask god's forgiveness the door will be opened. And it jumped to Revelation 3.20, uh, where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Again, a, a link there to this passage. Uh, the church in Revelation, to whom that was said, was the church at Laodicea. And they didn't get very good marks. Uh, the, the writer called them lukewarm and actually said, I sort of want to spit you out of my mouth. Uh, not to get carried away with revelation there. That's another topic, but behold, I stand at the door and knock. Ask and given. It does not mean abusing generosity of the spirit when the door knocks. Uh, not wildly inappropriate asking either. There's, a, there's an old song that went, oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Uh, that's not what it is. And in fact, James chapter four, verse three, has a stern warning about asking for the wrong things. And I'm quoting, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your indulgences. I think for most of us, the problem is not that we are too eager to ask for the wrong thing. The problem is we're not eager, nearly eager enough to ask for the right things. Uh, bear that in mind. And uh, a caution, be careful of the term evil there in that, um, those verses. It's not in the sense that we're totally depraved as some Calvinists would probably have us think or want, want us to think, but simply the fact that all of us fall short of God's favor. In uh, Mark 10th chapter it said, no one is good but God. So. Just kind of be careful with that term evil. Okay, we're going to jump to the next little short verse, and then we'll hear from our friend. Uh, who's Judy's the reader? I think that's me. In You're... everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. And we know that as the golden, golden rule. Ah, oh, very good. You all get good marks for that one. When did you first learn the golden rule? Do you remember? Probably as a child in Sunday school, I can't say that I remember for sure, for sure but it seems like I've always known it. Yeah, same. I learned it in Bible, um, vacation Bible school uh, as a child. Okay, Bible school. I was in uh, Catholic school, second grade. Second grade, Nick. I think I may have learned it from one of my parents. Any other, anybody else learn a different route? Uh, it's one of only two of Jesus' summaries of the scriptures of Israel, where he says, on these hang all the law and prophets. Uh, if you check Matthew 7, 12, alongside Matthew 22, 
it's the other passage where Jesus says this summarizes the law and the prophets um, to love your neighbor, love God and love your neighbor. And again, on these hang all the law and prophets. And these are sort of a guide for us through which the rest of the Torah and Jesus' teaching should be kind of filtered. It does not mean that these verses are all you need to know. If you know these verses, ah, you got it all, you don't need to know. It's sort of a filter through which we view other things, and that's important. Um, okay, now I'm go going to get Amy Jill here. Uh, Amy, are you here yet? She's coming in. If only I can click the right screen share item here. The golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you, is not where it ends. The golden rule continues, for this is the law and the prophets. A little bit later in the gospel, Jesus is approached in Mark by a scribe and Matthew by a Pharisee, and he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus talks about love of God, Deuteronomy 6, and love of neighbor, Leviticus 19. And he says, on these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. So now I've got love of God and love of neighbor, law and prophets, and I've got golden rule, law and prophets. It's both and it's more. To stop at love of God and love of neighbor, or to stop at the golden rule and and say, I don't need the rest, is to sell everything short. It is somewhat like saying, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. No, in fact, you needed more. So kindergarten is where you start. The golden rule or the love commands, that's where you start. But if you end there, everything will go awry. The golden rule presumes that everybody else wants what I want. And that would be imposing my will and my desires and projecting them onto everybody else. And that is not necessarily a good thing because it doesn't let my neighbor be my neighbor. So we start with the golden rule, but then we look at all the other rules. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't take a false oath and onward. And we continue to build those fences. In effect, the golden rule without the rest of the Torah and the prophets, the golden rule without the friends is at best tarnished. I like to speak about living into the kingdom of heaven rather than living in the kingdom of heaven. As if there's a process, you're continually moving in there. Living into the kingdom means continuing that muscle memory, continuing to practice the piety as it should be practiced. Living into the kingdom means continuing to train ourselves, checking ourselves when we find ourselves becoming judgmental, checking ourselves when we find that we're focused on the self too much and not enough on the neighbor, checking ourselves when our greed gets in the way of our compassion. Living into the kingdom is a practice or a praxis. It's a way of life. Judaism would talk about halacha, the way you walk, the path you follow. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is setting out. Here's the path. You'll fall off the path on occasion, but you can get back on. And it's easier if you're doing it with community. It's easier if you're doing it with knowledge of the rest of the gospel. You are a child of God in the image and likeness of God. And you've got the skills and the ability to live into the kingdom. What you need is the will. And that's something you can pray for. When Jesus talks about not throwing your pearls before swine, I don't think anybody was sitting around going, oh, finally something I don't have to worry about because I am not tempted to take the pearls off and find a pig and toss the pearls away. Mm -hmm. So this has to be some sort of metaphor. Um, don't give what is holy to the dogs. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't beat your head against the wall, taking your precious gifts and your precious concerns and trying to force them on somebody who simply doesn't want to listen and cannot appreciate and wants you to go away. Sometimes the wiser thing is to walk away.
there may come another day when you can try to sow those seeds again to mix a metaphor. But don't waste your time and don't waste your talents on people who do not want to listen to you. But if they don't listen, nevertheless, because you are a child of God, show by your actions the appropriate way forward and show what it means to live into the kingdom. Civility is in short supply in our society. It's easier to call people names or yell at someone or simply dismiss them. It's easier to go onto the internet and look up people who agree with us rather than to deal with people who might be on the other side of any one or another issue. We're very uncivil. Argument has replaced negotiation. Calling names has replaced community. The Sermon on the Mount actually insists on civility, even with people with whom you do not agree. That's what, in part, it means to love one's enemy. Be civil. Be decent. Be the child of God. When I was a child, my mother would always say, act like a lady, which sounds very old-fashioned these days, but I knew what she meant. If someone calls you a name, don't ratchet up the violence. Don't call a name back. Say, oh, thank you very much. Now, when I was seven or eight, that was very difficult, but it was true even then that when I responded to a name call positively and politely, the person who called me names got very, very frustrated. And I admit to having a certain feeling of gloat about that. It actually works. Be decent. Be civil. Model how you would like people to act toward you. And here's one of the places where the golden rule actually works. Be civil. And that means even if you heartily disagree with the person on the other side of the table, you have to remember that that person is also in the image and likeness of God. And I don't care whether that person is Adolf Hitler or Pol Pot or Torquemada or any other contemporary politician whom you dislike on whatever side. Name calling does not help. Calling out doesn't help very much either. Calling in helps. Don't be violent. Be a peacemaker. But when you need to say something, say it clearly, calmly, and with civility. When Jesus says, don't worry, I worry anyway. And sometimes I say, really, Jesus? When Jesus says, knock and the door will be opened, I have sometimes the same reaction, really, Jesus? Because sometimes I've knocked on doors and the door doesn't open. And sometimes I've tried and the doors get slammed in my face, talking to administrators, talking to politicians, sometimes talking to neighbors, sometimes talking to my children. So what do you do? You persevere. And you recognize that when you're in community and when there's love all around, that in fact, the door opens. It opens because you persevere, because you're not acting with violence, because you're acting with civility and kindness and with patience. And in community, the door, of course, always opens. And that's what it means in a church or a synagogue when you need something. Knock, and it will be open to you. But you have to be a member of that community for it to work. This doesn't mean knock on every door. You're in community. You know the doors that will be open to you. And the people behind those doors know you. You can count on each other. You will not take advantage of each other. You will be generous to each other. There may be separate houses, but the doors are always open to the beloved neighbor. Jesus talks about going through the narrow gate, which is hard. We might think about that statement we hear later in the gospel about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Rabbinic Judaism tells exactly the same proverb, by the way, except there it's an elephant going through the eye of a needle. Entering through the narrow gate is the same thing. You don't need all the baggage. You don't need all the stuff. The treasures you have are the ones that are laid up in heaven, not the ones holding you down, weighing you down, whether through literal heaviness or through the cares that you worry about. Narrow gate, divest. There's stuff you don't need. There's baggage you can unload. And the baggage is not only the baggage of material stuff. The baggage is judgmentalism. The baggage is 
undeserved anger. The baggage is hatred. The baggage is worry. Let it go. Figure out what's really important. Figure out where your treasure really is, what is of ultimate concern, and let the rest go. And then you stop worrying, and you stop judging, and you've got a taste of the kingdom of heaven right there. Deuteronomy warns against false prophets. For Deuteronomy, false prophets are prophets who lead you to strange gods that you did not know which in the time of ancient Israel would have been the Canaanite gods or the gods of, of the Moabites or the Babylonians or the Egyptians. But we also have false prophets and strange gods today. We have the false prophets of, of beauty and of fame and of wealth. The false prophets who come on television or on the radio or now on the internet and say, buy my product and your life will be perfect. The false prophets in the churches who say, send me money and you will win the lottery. And there are other false prophets. False prophets are politicians who promise us everything but demand nothing. False prophets are pastors who say everything you do is absolutely perfect and there's nothing left that's required of you. False prophets are politicians who say to us, oh, we have equal justice in the country. There's nothing to worry about. So how do you know a true prophet? A true prophet tells you what you need to do. A false prophet stays with the status quo. A true prophet challenges you. A false prophet says everything is fine. A true prophet says we need justice. A false prophet says everybody already has it. And that's where we need to judge between true prophets who demand, true prophets who tell us what we need, and false prophets who are perfectly happy with the status quo. Yep. Just a minute, I want to stop her. And he we'll delivers her. an interpretation of Torah, a new Torah, as a new. Okay. This is sort of a closing thing. We'll come back to her. Oh, wow. Do you think we could require all uh, elected officials to take a course in the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> you know, she really hit home there contemporarily, I think. To me, she did. Yeah. It, Sermon on the Mount insists on civility and a bunch of other things she said. Uh, maybe somebody can propose a constitutional amendment that. <laughs> at, at work, yeah. they um, talk about the platinum rule, which to me was like, oh geez, the golden rule is what we follow. But it, it the idea of do what somebody else wants for themselves, do for others what they want, not what you think they want is the platinum rule. And so she she discussed that too, that mm -hmm. they don't necessarily want what you want to give them. They need what they need. Good point, Suzanne. Uh, yeah. Got some strong yes, Suzanne, that make, Susan. Um, that, that makes me, um, Suzanne, that made me really connect with that because that's person to person that's putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Oh. And I think that collectively, you know, in terms of politics, et cetera, it's each and every one of us moving the needle. So individual action is, is uh, incredibly uh, important. Um, at least that's my belief. Uh, I hope that makes sense. It does. We've got... Um... The next segments here, there are three warnings that follow kind of in quick succession. And
Hang with me. Okay. Anne, this is yours to read. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy. That leads to destruction and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard. That leads to life. And there are few who find it. Okay, Amy Dill had, AJ had some comments on the narrow road. What, what do you think Jesus meant by the narrow gate or, yeah, you know, the narrow gate? It's almost like the road less traveled, right? Um, it's, uh, always, it's always that temptation to take the easy way or to do the thing that's most acceptable to people than to really follow Jesus and do the difficult things that need to be done, knowing that you might be persecuted for it or looked down upon. But it's that ability to have the courage to do it. And you're right, Nick. In fact, you said there are few people follow that road. So you're right. You're right. It is the road less traveled. Other thoughts on the narrow gate? I, I liked how she uh, said the baggage that you're carrying. You got a lot of stuff around you. You're not going to get through that gate. You've got to unload some stuff before you get there. I, I like that imagery. Well, how do you know um, which road you're on, <laughs> the, the narrow or the wide? I mean, how do you discern that? Help me out here. I, you know, I, in those moments when you've got to make a tough decision, um, I've always gone to prayer. I mean, if I'm really confused as to which the right road to take, um, I will pray over it and try to have a conversation with God or Jesus. Um, very often it can start out as a debate <laughs> between me and him, but over time, you know, trying to listen to what he's telling me and what I'm thinking, you know, you end up taking his advice, not your own advice. But I, I think it's important to pray and to have actual conversation when you're at the moment of confusion or you're at a crossroads. Can we say amen to that? Amen. And any other hints on how we know it's wide or narrow that we're going through on? Um, I think Nick was sort of suggesting you can't just go with the flow. Choices matter and take it to prayer. Um, see, I think I? having somebody to talk with about to, you know, a spiritual friend is, is another helpful thing to just kind of talk it out and be willing to listen, you know, Am I resisting something? Why am I resisting it? You know, maybe it's a good resistance, but maybe there's something else going on that I need to pay attention to that's getting me off track. Okay, good point. Somebody just to bounce it off and say, mm -hmm. help me out here. Okay, let's go to the next verse, which I think is Nick. Yes, it's the and false prophets. Beware. For you. Yep, this is it. <laughs> Thank you. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. I mean, the comment I would make about this is that 
it's by their deeds. You know, we'll know they're the Christians by their love and by their deeds. And and I think that's really the difference, you know, with a good tree is it's the deeds that it encourages you to perform or do. Um, and bad deeds usually are reflective of getting bad advice or bad trees. Which, which responds to the question, how do you identify false prophets? And I guess the sermon goes on to say that you know them by their fruits, by their deeds. Um, and just because somebody proclaims an easy road, it, it's not easy street. Uh, Got to be but aware I of that. Go back to that, like with my comment about having a spiritual friend to talk things through. If you're always getting that person, oh yeah, you're fine, you know, you're, yeah, I, I want somebody to challenge me sometimes, you know, and I think that's the way a false prophet doesn't challenge you, you know, just lets you off the hook, like, oh, it's no big deal. Okay, yeah. everybody, remember that when Pastor Jenny, that she needs is a challenge, she needs yeah. to be challenged. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not always fun, but that's the point, you know, it's a hard way, it's the narrow way. Um, you know, it's, it's we'll help you along that way then. Yeah, I'll help you too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, in, in ancient is Israel, false prophets were people who claimed to be speaking the word of God, but actually were not. And obviously listening to them leads the wrong way. Um, and there's that little illustration there. They can be glamorous. They can be dressed up in sheep's clothing. And you don't know the wolf isn't going to show its claws and bare its teeth if it's dressed up like a, a sheep and then they can lead you astray. So it's really can be dangerous. The, the fruit we bear, uh, says the text, the text says people know them by their fruit. Uh, do you know the fruit of the spirit? Do you know that little passage in Galatians? Jean, do you know that passage? I do. Can you help us out there? I used to do music with uh, young children and had all sorts of songs to teach this and that. And some were um, instructive in different ways. But one is, I've got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit of the spirit. You'll find, you'll find it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And if you're walking close to God, this fruit will grow in you, and you'll have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit of God. Look at all the hands, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Galatians 5, 22, 23, if you want to make a little note of that, the, the fruit, and it is, it's singular, it's not fruits, it's the fruit of the Spirit, is all those um, items that, that Jean mentioned there. So that will guide you in being fruitful, and now let me get the next passage. which I think is Jean. Okay. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Yikes. Yeah. My, my, my version didn't have yikes in there. <laughs> uh, That's like, what? amen. Oh. <laughs> um, Say la. <laughs> yeah. pretty, pretty straightforward, that little segment there. Uh, here we had the, this Sermon on the Mount, which began with such comfort in the Beatitudes, kind of ends with the challenge and warning, as AJ suggests, 
beware of those who use smoke and mirrors. Uh, and um, verse 23, which makes reference to evildoers. And AJ says, a better translation is people working lawlessness, uh, which is really those who deny the validity of God's law. And there is a stern warning. Let's jump to our final segment of verses, which Jenny will do for us. Everyone, okay. everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Okay, hearers and doers. Uh, Hearing the, those verses, uh, testing your, your memories here, your history, do, there are two, one's a song, one's a hymn. Do it, any song or hymn come to mind with that verse, those verses? Yeah, the wise man built his house upon a rock. <laughs> How many know that? Uh, a good old Sunday school song wise man build his house on the rock and the foolish man person builds house on the sand and the house on the sand went smash, <laughs> smash. <laughs> uh how about a hymn no no answer my hope is built on nothing less yeah. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand all other ground. Mm -hmm. The sinking, the sinking sand. sand. Um, in um, the uh, text, uh, Amy's, Amy Jill's book, uh, page 123, had a great little saying, which I just loved. It said, leave the deeds of power, the mighty works to God. Leave the walking on water to Jesus. Instead, feed the hungry. Leave the signs and wonders to the prophets of Israel and John the Baptist. Instead, clothe the naked. Leave the deeds of power, the mighty works to God. Instead, welcome the stranger. To do that is miracle enough. I just love that statement. Not being just hearers of the word, but doers. Uh, not worry about the mighty acts. God takes care of those things. Um, hearers and doers. Uh, she has a little closing statement, which I'm going to go to in a minute, unless somebody has any comment or reaction to that passage on being hearers and doers, building on the rock, not the sand. Okay, oh, let's God, get her up for that. Anne, I'm looking for that in my book, and I can't find it on 123. Where? 123. Yeah, is it in the middle, the top? How did I miss it? Yeah, I didn't mm -hmm. see it on 123 either. Yeah. It's great. I'm. Uh, maybe I copied the wrong page down. Okay. All right. Well, never mind. Okay. Never mind. The the quote makes it seem attainable. The, the things you're supposed to do are attainable. They're not the all big, wonderful, huge yeah. things that are unattainable. Let, leave that to God. Do Isn't that right, Suzanne? Time. Yeah. Amen. Um, okay. I, it was a different page. Search the book. You'll, you'll Never, find mind. It. Never mind. Um, okay. Here's her 
wrap up. Okay, Amy, how do we get you started? New Moses. In this sense, Jesus is interpreting Torah because that's what Jews do. But Matthew is also interpreting Jesus. And we then come in in the next role as our own interpreters because we have to interpret the words of Jesus. When Jesus says, don't hate, we need to figure out how to live in a world that has no hate. When Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine, we have to figure out how best to allocate our resources. We all have our own take on the Sermon on the Mount. To read it and not act it is insufficient. More to read it and not talk about it is insufficient. If we are to recognize the Sermon on the Mount as a communal document, an Our Father document, a document written to disciples, then it's the job of the disciple to take the next step. What does this text mean to me? What does it mean to my community? And after we've done that act of interpretation, we then try to live out the Sermon on the Mount and thereby keep taking steps on that narrow pathway toward the kingdom of heaven. The meaning of the Sermon on the Mount is inexhaustible. Anytime you go back, you will see something new. And then think about it and bring it up to your neighbors and bring it up to your friends or send me an email because I could always use a new reading and continue to learn and continue to study and continue to walk. And you'll find your perfection because you'll find the kingdom of heaven. Don't you just love her? Mm -hmm. She just has a way of bringing the gospel to reality and launching us on the next steps that we have on page 127 in the text. And I did just check this. It is 127. Um, one, two, third paragraph down. I, I won't read it, but she has a couple suggestions of where our next steps in the journey take us. Uh, also, she suggests taking an inventory of our lives, of, of how they mesh with the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things we don't want to do is use Sermon on the Mount, or the Bi Bible itself is a self-help book. It's not that, but it guides us in our journey. And these sayings of Jesus, as AJ said back at the beginning, were probably said at a whole bunch of different times to give it all at once would have just flummoxed uh, the hearers. And, and we hear we've sort of stretched it out over six weeks, but it, it's kind of a lifetime thing. Um, for our wrapping it up, Has your Christian understanding been enhanced by this series taught by a Jewish person, professor? What, what's your reaction? Well, for Absolutely. me, it... <laughs> go ahead, Nick. No, go ahead, Ann. Absolutely. I thought that this was one of the best because, because she, to get a different perspective, it's kind of, it goes back to what Jenny said about when you're going through a spiritual journey, you talk to somebody else and that helps you to see things you wouldn't see just on your own. And hearing a woman who's been raised in the Jewish faith, who understands the Torah and she just got a different, different perspective. And I loved it. I really, really loved it because she made me see things I hadn't seen uh, before because yeah, I, me too. In, I live in this cocoon of Christianity. Well said. Yeah, I, I was going to agree with Anne. I, I, I think there are times when, when she sounds really like a Christian. You know? and, and then you remember, and you have to remind yourself that Jesus was born and died a Jew. You know, Christianity was something that we titled and 
we evolved from his teaching, but he was Jewish. And so getting mm -hmm. her insights are really helpful because she, as much as she almost sounds like a Christian at times, she really does understand Judaism. And actually it shows very nicely how Judaism and Christianity can live side by side very well because it, we feel it in our hearts, whether we're Jews or we're Christians, that this is really truly you know, the word of God. So I agree with Anna. I mean, I think it gives yeah. so much more depth to have that Jewish perspective. Mm -hmm. And when she does give us that Jewish perspective, she's really talking for Jesus who was a Jew. Amen, yeah. Any other comments? You may have been answered this one uh, in the comments you've already made. Um, I, I like how she emphasizes community. We're in community. We, as part of the Westminster community, are in community, part of the Christian community. Has it helped you in um, new insight in God's will for Westminster's community of faith at this time? Has that been helpful? I'm just amazed at how much we are doing as a church, even in these times of being away from one another. Um, it's truly amazing how things go on and we are still the church. I think Nancy's comment is, is well taken as we said back at the beginning of the lesson today, as we cited some of the things that are happening, even in sequestration. Well, mm -hmm. it, it makes me think we are being doers of the word. Um, not, not like you said earlier, Bob, we don't want to pat ourselves on the back and be too, you know, boastful. But, but I think it's good that we are taking <clears throat> Jesus' words and teaching and, you know, seriously and living it out. And as Sue Kelly said, you know, when we give our gifts to the church we can trust that they are being carefully um, used for god's kingdom and um so mm -hmm. okay lastly um to help jenny and the adult education team do you moving forward do you have topics particular themes books bible Bible studies that you would like to see scheduled? I mean, one, one book I've, I've always wanted to really- Are you taking notes, Jenny? I am. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, Nick. I've always really wanted to go into is the book of Revelation. And whenever I've brought that up, you know, the pastor or, the, or priest or whoever it was goes, it's so difficult. <laughs> it's so much symbolism and imagery and- Ugh. So as a result, it never gets done. I, I mean, anywhere I've ever requested it. But I would really like to do a study of the book of Revelation if somebody's brave enough to teach it. I've got that. That's my favorite yeah. book. Good. Jean, my, wanted, do you want to teach it? No, I'm not a teacher, but it's my favorite book of the Bible. Why is it your favorite? Can you tell us? I love all the hymns of praise in there. You know, we may face a lot of trial and tribulation, but there's always praise and thanksgiving in there. I love it. Holy, 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 the hymn we sing comes from Revelation. Just a comment, and, and I agree with Nick. Revelation is not as complicated as people make it out to be. And but I don't want to teach it, Jenny. I could, but I don't want to, um, but be in touch with me. I have a, I want to talk to you about some possibilities on doing that. Okay. Um, it, it is an exciting book and yeah, and we want to keep Nick happy and everybody else. <laughs> uh, other things you would like to see covered. Uh, 
you mentioned how you liked uh, AJ's presentation here. She has, I think, uh, Jenny has some other. Yeah, I have. Things. I have a study of hers on the parables. Um, so this is helpful for me to hear. It sounds like people have appreciated her um, teaching. So that might be one that we'll offer. I think actually one of the women's Tuesday um, small group is actually, so you guys are using that right now. Are you liking it? Yeah, so Anne's holding it up. We have well, we'll start it on, we started on December 1st. Right. Oh, you haven't started it yet. Now. Yeah, my copy arrived yesterday. Yeah. I'm really so, so maybe we'll do that in the future. Okay. Um, I have another one of hers on um, Holy Week. So before COVID-19, Don and I were talking about, oh, maybe we would do that as our Lenten study. And I, I know she goes to churches and speaks like we could bring her in, you know, to speak and do um, a um, Passover Seder, Seder with us, you know, as a congregation. So that was sort of in our thinking and then COVID hit. So, you know, that might be in the future something as we come out of this that we might think about scheduling down the road. Um, okay. It wouldn't be this year because we're still in COVID, but maybe next year. Um, that could be something to look to. Um, and I, I, I may have even another one on there. I'm not positive. Um, but I, I know I at least have those two other ones that, that we mentioned. Well, the team's always looking for suggestions and ideas. Yeah. Uh, so just to let you all know, so next week begins Advent, and we have a journey class scheduled for Advent called Incarnation, which is an Adam Hamilton study. Um, Patty Stewart was going to teach this next the first one I'm preaching next Sunday so that would make it very hard for me to teach since I'm the preacher of the day when I spoke with Patty this week she went what she got it mixed up in her head like she was thinking Advent started the following week so they're fam they're, they're down in Florida right now for Thanksgiving I guess you know they're going to be down there so she wasn't going to be here and you know she was very apologetic and it, it, it's just turned crazy um she has the dvd i have ordered another study guide and another um, book to go with it and it hasn't come yet so i don't have that so bottom line is this we're not going to have a journey class next sunday um we'll start the advent series actually the second sunday of advent um she and I have to talk, but maybe we extend it into, so there's a Sunday after Christmas, you know, there, there's five Sundays or four Sundays. That, so we'll, we'll see, you know, if we wanted to do that fourth one on that last Sunday, or if we could combine a couple of them into one week, I don't know if that would be smart to do, but just to give you that heads up, I apologize for our technical difficulties, but. Um, well, use the time well. It is what it is. <laughs> Jenny, um, if, if there's a book, though, that we should get or DVD, whatever, could you let us know by email so we can order it? Because yeah, I, I, when think, I Christian books usually takes me seven to ten days. Yeah, to so it. it's called Incarnation. Incarnation. And it's by Adam Hamilton. Okay. And I think she, I've asked her to put that out into the I, I know it, it appeared in one of the emails in past weeks, but so that's coming up for for journey um, or for Advent. Then in um, in January, we're going to be doing a book called The Color of Compromise: um, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. So this is by Jamar Tis Tisby. So you might you know, put that on your Christmas list if somebody's wanting to buy you something for Christmas that if you want to be part of that study, The Color of Complicity. What's the name of the author again? Jamar, J-E-M-A-R, Tisby, T-I-S-B-Y. Okay. And those are- yeah, both, Go ahead. Those are both DVD study series, but there's books that you can read with them. So 
I think it's always nice to have the book because you'll get more out of it, yeah. but I don't think it's absolutely necessary to have the book if you didn't want to go to that much reading and purchase and all of that. Because okay. we will have a DVD to share with, with it. But if you want to really read you know, and get more out of it, um, the book is always a good idea to, to get. Anything else? And then Lent. Well, one of the things we're still Andrew, just what we're doing for Lent on the end. Andrew. Go ahead. Well, one of the things that um, because last summer we started this series, you know, we did the book of Philippians and then we were looking at doing uh the Lehman. Yeah. And um, and with that background in mind, um, I started doing just on my own uh, a lot of like like little bit of sort of research on the apostles, the lives of the apostles and their interactions with each other. And it amazes me just how little we know about them. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they've had this huge impact on us. And I think, you know, maybe it's some sort of study of, 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 of the apostles um, mm -hmm. would really, or, and, and Paul himself, and just to have this general background before we attack, tackle things like uh, Philemon would be really, really useful. Kind of that could be a really clever approach. 101 before yeah. we do the higher level stuff. Yeah. Also, Andrew, there's a Wednesday night, you know, Bible study we call Gathering of Men. And we've been doing that in there. Like we've done several studies of Paul. Um, but you might look into joining us on Wednesday nights. Okay. I'll take a look at that. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, for closing, I have a prayer for us to share together. And uh, hope you all have a blessed Thanksgiving, albeit differently, yeah. different than usual. But I'm we... thankful for all of you, and I'm thankful for you, Bob, um, leading us this today. Very grateful. Thank you. Well, we'll put the prayer on the end here and we can pray it together we have been to the mount and, and as, it, it were, as were been seated at your feet lord jesus, lord jesus our, gratitude our gratitude is abundant for these wonderful words of life thanks for the wisdom and insight of aj as well as the sharings of our modest group these past six weeks now, now it is time to go down from the mount and minister. By your power, may we be moved to a continued life of action, living ever more faithfully as your ideal community, showing ever more clearly the glory and love we see in you, Jesus. Bless Westminster Church. Bless the ecumenical church. Bless the people of all faith traditions and those who have found no faith belief. Here we go, Lord, to live your word. Go thou with us. Amen. Okay, cheerio. All right, blessings, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Bob, Bob, can I ask you a question? Happy Thanksgiving. Before you get off. Sure. Um, one of the things, you know, when I was reading about the false prophets is to me, that's one of the most serious warnings that he gives us. Because if you think about it, particularly in, in today's world, you know, a lot of celebrities, I would call false prophets. A lot of sports figures, I would call false prophets. Mm -hmm. A lot of politicians, I would call false prophets. And I think, you know, what Jesus is saying is they're all around us. And some of them are very attractive. They're very glib. For sure. They're very good with words in that they can really lead us astray. And, and sometimes I don't think we think about that enough. You know, we'll see somebody and we'll say, wow, that's a really cool person. That person's really smart. You know, maybe they're the smartest person I ever met. But I think it's at that point where your antennas have to go up and say, what are they really preaching or saying? And I, I just didn't think maybe we gave enough emphasis to that, especially given the, the current state of the world that we're in. Uh -huh. and, and particularly politicians, because 
you know how uh, <laughs> slimy they can be. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a real truth to that. Uh, and they're dangerous. You feel profits. that too? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, as, the, as the text says, they, they come in sheep's clothing and oh, they're cuddly, nice little sheep. And when inside they're ravenous wolves, as, as the text says, exactly. and we're suckered in. It is serious. And I, I think back to Jesus being tempted by the devil. I mean, the devil in his way was very attractive, smart, and to the point that he would challenge Jesus and, and you know, make these offerings to him, you know, do this and you'll have all the power you ever want and all these kinds of little things that he did. But I mean, even Jesus could get tempted by, by somebody like that. And I, if the, he could get tempted, we all can get tempted. That, that's a great link because yes, every one of those temptations to Jesus, they were attractive things. They look good. Feed exactly. the hungry. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that text, Jenny, comes up in the um, lectionary. But. It's often it's often at the beginning of Lent, the Jesus temptations. But I, I don't know. I'd have to look at the calendar. Yeah, I would too. Mm -hmm. I think it really helps to what they talked about earlier about looking at what are the fruit of, of the uh, uh, of the tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you look at our politicians and we have children in cages, what kind of fruit is that? Um, oh yeah. You know, I mean, if if there's not love and compassion and mercy in their fruit, then you really have to be careful um, that they are false prophets. I think it's so easy. I think about that phrase spin and mm -hmm. how things can be said in a way, yeah. almost any way that your first reaction is, hmm, that makes sense. And boy, if we stopped there at what, a, you know, at what one first here sounds like it makes sense, we'd be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. You gotta take the time to look for the fruit and identify the fruit, you know. So the onus is on us to identify that fruit. And I think that's the key thing that you gotta really examine the deeds. It's not just what's said or how it's said. Mm -hmm. It's what what are the deeds that come about by what they do. It's not just saying Lord, Lord. It's the one that does the will of God, the yeah. fruit. I, I struggled with with that section about um, not giving pearls to swine and and um, and how she talked about you know if, if somebody really doesn't want to hear your message. Don't waste your, kind of your time and talent on it. But, and then it kind of led me back to this division we have, particularly right now in our country. And we're, 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 we're told we need to dialogue and be civil. Um, but, you know, how, how do you do that when people don't want to, to listen? Or, they're, you know, everybody's sort of so... Um, Rigid. <laughs> Rigid, thank you. That's the word. Yeah, um, uh, that's a real struggle. Well, I, I think I, I think there's also a message there, which is certain things you you can't change, and then when you recognize that, you should leave it to the Lord. You know, you may not be able to get through. You can certainly pray that maybe Jesus can get through to them. But, but I think that's the point. We, we can't save everybody. And we should really apply our, our talents to people we can really help. But I think there's some things you just have to leave to, to God. And I think it's saying our truth, which we hope is God's truth, in such a way that it is respectful and that it isn't demeaning people that you disagree with or see things differently. Right. And, and then, you know, you can listen and you can agree to disagree, but 
it, the climate we are in right now is very, very hard. It, it's, I won't go, I, I could say more, but I will just stop. We know what you would say. <laughs> Well, you can even be facing other Christians and, and there, there it gets, you know, how people are seeing what it means to follow Christ. This um, is so true. Very yes. divergent ways. Yeah. That's to me part of where we have to look at the fruit. Okay. Okay. Cheerio, everybody. Right. Everybody Thank have a good Thanksgiving. Enjoyed everyone's insight. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.